So to get started, I think, Harleen, maybe people here would like to know how you how you started things. Um, where you make your work, how you got to where you are today, how your vision changed from the beginning to now. Okay. So can everybody hear me? We're good. Yeah. All right. Um. So I gotta go back over the questions. So where do I make my um? Well, can you talk a little bit about your history as an artist? So um, I'm actually a self-taught artist. My academic background is a bachelor of science in animal behavior. So I actually had a psych degree. So I, my joke used to be, you can do something with a psych degree. It's just maybe not what you originally thought it was going to be. Um, the artwork that first came into um, kind of me doing it, of course, as a typical artist, I've always done it my whole life. So as a child, I was painting and drawing. Um, it's what I would do on Friday nights when I wasn't with my friends. I would be sketching actually horses quite a bit because my mom was a huge horse lover. As time went on, I uh, did not go to that route for school, into the arts, and I really let my parents down. They actually wanted me to go into the arts. I went into massage therapy <coughs> instead, and that was a very, very new field at that time. So when I first started, you only needed 500 hours to work in the city, and our business license is not what it is today. So it was aligned with more of the sketchy side of life with our business oh, licenses back then. I learned a lot through that and being in that field. I ended up creating programs that actually Lethbridge Community College taught. I taught down there for a little while in that program. And then I decided to go to university around the same time. I had moved to Southern Alberta to be with my husband, who was in the RCMP at the time. And while I was building my massage practice, I went to school and I had to complete two fine arts requirements to get my science degree. And that's where art came back into my life. So I went through those programs in university and I put down paintbrushes. That was it. Then fast forward, I had my first child and I needed a little bit of me time being a young mom. So I would paint when my husband would do daddy and me nights with my son. And from there, I actually started painting children. So I did impressionistic children, because that's what I knew. I knew kids. Um, I liked to create emotion in the paintings, and I didn't know what I was doing. I did not know the art industry. I didn't know anything as artists. I just painted the way I saw it and the way I felt. What ended up happening is a lot of people would come to my house to try and sell me something and they left with a commission of my children's paintings. <laughs> so I ended up sending um, these impressionistic children across uh, North America. So I actually have more of my paintings of children in the US than I have here in Canada, just the way life worked. Fast forward, I realized it's pretty hard to sell somebody else's child to another person. So I needed to look at another, basically, focus of work, which actually fast forwards me a little bit into looking at animals. And actually, Wendy is here, and Wendy was the first gallery owner that ever took my artwork. So I can single you out and <laughs> make you blush a little bit. I actually did a commissioned sea turtle painting, and I brought it into Wendy's gallery. And I asked her, I said, if I painted more like this, would I have a chance to hang in the gallery? She said yes, a few months later, she was carrying my artwork. That first sea turtle painting, I never ever painted another painting to look ever like it. So once I went through the process of painting that sea turtle, my artwork with the sea turtles completely changed, the colors changed, the way I saw them completely changed. Because once we go through something, we do change and shift who we are and we don't see the world the same anymore. And for whatever happened in that moment, between that first sea turtle painting and all of the rest, they, I could never go back and paint that first sea turtle painting ever again, the way I did it. I wish I could, but it's, it's gone. <laughs> um, so that leads us to your process. So the process is, I work from photographs. So each of my sea turtles is actually a portrait. So the platelets on the sea turtle, the green sea turtle, is actually its fingerprints. 
So each and every sea turtle that I paint, the marine biologists that work with that animal actually know who I painted. And I make sure I'm very specific in that. I work with a conservation group with Malama Nakhanu in Hawaii, in Oahu, in, um, on the North Shore in Oahu. And they have all their sea turtles numbered. And I paint from their <coughs> beaches, I try to paint from their beaches exclusively simply because I can give scientific facts about the animals so that people start to realize I'm not painting some random sea turtle, I'm actually painting a living creature to bring more of the awareness to the conservation. A lot of my sea turtle artwork that I sell, I send either donations to them for them to raise money with my artwork or I send them funds back over. The interesting thing with that is, is I don't get tax deductibles. A lot of people think that we get tax deductible when we send out, but I'm sending out a country. So it's not the same as if it was in Canada. So it really is just about promoting the work that they do. Because of that relationship, um, they're huge supporters. I, I am so blessed that I have this huge supporter uh, of my work in a totally different country. I have developed a very close relationship um, at first just through emails with the head uh, education volunteer with uh, Milana Nihanu and I met her for the first time in 2017. I didn't spend a lot of time that trip. That was the first time I had ever left my family. So at that time my youngest was five years old. My oldest would have been about grade three and I left them alone with their dad for the first time for five days. So I was a little nervous about that. Um, it was a quick trip in, quick trip out. A lot of people thought I was laying on the beach. I was up at five and I was taking photographs of sea turtles until it went dark. It was a work trip. We fast, we come to our time now. So it's, we went in 20, just this last fall. That was the second time I ever met Debbie. So that was the second time I met her. This time I was with my family. We got to spend a lot of intimate time. I saw her every day for seven days. And because of that, I show up, she greets me, big hugs, and then she shares all the new sea turtle facts with me. So I get to know about these animals. I have people who come into my art booths when I show all my artwork, and they think, well, somebody just went on a holiday. And I'm like, well, not quite. I, I do this on purpose. I'm really focused for a reason. They go, do you know anything about animals? How much time do you have? <laughs> because I made it a point to know everything I can about these animals. So I'm not just saying I'm painting them because I think they're pretty. I'm painting them because I truly do think they're amazing animals. I don't go in the water to take the photographs. I'm terrified of the water. So that is why most of them are on land. Um, I did swim with the sea turtles when we went as a family. And I do have to say, because I know what hunts them. <laughs> in those waters, so I um, made sure I was breathing very, very slowly and my movements were very rhythmically because I know what attracts the sharks and I did not want to be that causing them to um, The process, so I work from photograph. The backgrounds may or may not be what was in the photograph, but the turtle is because I want to make sure that I actually have it. It is a portrait. Yeah. So. I just wanted to, at first when I saw the work, I didn't really know too much about the project, so I thought it was all about sea turtles, and very similar to what you were saying, you know, well, you know, she probably got these pictures from wherever, and uh, then with more research, I discovered that the image of the sea turtle, it's not just an image, it's a metaphor, actually, isn't it, for humans as well, as the sea turtle. There's um, a huge meaning to the animal, the sea turtle. So if we look at the spiritual meaning, they're actually really linked to wisdom and about slowing down life. So I look at it that the sea turtle came into my life. So some people would say that they're a spirit animal of myself. And I think to some extent that would be true. Um, I, I look at it that the sea turtle becomes a muse and it shares its wisdom. That's how I write it in my book, is that it shares its wisdom with me. The sea turtles themselves, I try and choose what image to paint from to evoke a certain emotion. Um, 
The animal itself, I think, is amazing, and I think us humans should really look at them in awe. They've been here far longer than we ever have. <coughs> Some of these animals can potentially live beyond 100 years, so longer than we will ever grace them, these lands. So many cultures, in fact, almost all of them, actually base their existence off of the sea turtle, or the turtle. In India, it is a turtle, or it's a tortoise. And these animals have such deep roots into basically our culture and who we are as societies in a way. They created the land in most of these. And I think it's a little bit about just honoring the animal itself. The messages that come while I'm painting the sea turtles are just messages that come to me. So it could be a message of love, it could be a message of, hey, we need to take a step back in life and we look at who we are. There's two types of happiness in the world. There's actually two types of happiness that scientists study. One is hedonic, where they look at it as just what is going to be gratifying to me right now in this moment. So is it buying that skirt? Is it um, doing this because it makes me feel good? The other one is eudaimonic, and that's where my artwork really falls in. So it is truly about doing something beyond yourself to make a difference around you, whether it is to someone um, someone other than yourself or for the world as a, as a whole. And the messages that I really share in my book and then around with these paintings, because a lot of these paintings aren't in the book, it is a lot about trying to make ourselves better so that we can become better for the world and then ultimately for the earth. My artwork at the very, very beginning, I was on a cruise with my family. I had painted a couple sea turtles and I wanted to do more. I realized that it potentially could reach further people than I ever could. And that's when I realized that I could do conservation and how endangered these animals were. And so I actually contacted a whole bunch of conservation groups at that time and offered them 100% of the profits for them to sell my print and I would make as many as I needed to, to fund them. Not one of them took me up on it. They did not take me up on it until I approached them like a business and did profit sharing. So it was a really interesting message that I got through that was knowing one's worth. I worked with a lot of conservation groups because of that and then over time the meaning shifted and I saw it almost as my personal way of um, meditation was in creating my paintings. I started sharing the messages that came to me while I was creating the painting itself and it made meaning to other people. So then I took the big leap and wrote my book. And I have to say that when the book went to the editor for the first time, I woke up in a panic. Because for the first time, someone was going to see into what I was actually creating. And I felt extremely vulnerable with that. More so than just hanging a painting up. To an artist, hanging a painting up is vulnerable. It's a part of who we are. And a lot of times, because we're standing in the public's eye, people will um, be very free in telling us what they like or don't like about our words. But now to put my words beside it, it's a deeper look into who I am and how I see the world. And so it was a really interesting step for me, but I haven't taken, I haven't really looked back once it happened because I have gotten so many messages about how that made differences for people. Even my editor told me one time, so she just had the edited book. She said she had to reread it a couple times in one day because it helped bring her back into balance for whatever she was experiencing that day. And just those messages, you don't realize the impact you can have on other people until you actually showcase truly who you are. So. I just wonder how you, like you've done so many things, and as well as um, massage, you know, massage therapist, Reiki, <coughs> I don't know the name of the other affiliation you have for the lead. They open their records, yeah. but you have all these things. Yeah. How do you balance your home life, your business life, and art as an artist? Sometimes not very well. <laughs> I won't be honest. Yeah. Yeah. This week's been a bit, a little bit crazy. <laughs> um, yeah, I have. I do a lot, and it's funny because I actually had a talk with my oldest son because my kids are very active. They're very engaged in their lives, and I looked at my oldest who's 17 now, and I said, you know, I think I taught you really poorly because I taught you to chase all your dreams, and it creates a very busy life. He's like, yes, mom, it does. Yes, it does. We all chase who we are 
and it can be a balance. I actually currently now, because um, I'm working as a coach out of a clinic in Short Park, um, empowering people to really become secure and become self-aware within themselves. So I'm also doing my master's in applied positive psychology, coaching psychology, and everything I do, it is about, it's following an interest. So I set time aside where I paint, and it's a business. So those days are art days, and that is who I am. And the talk that um, was mentioned before is I was asked to do a public speaking engagement in the fall, and I chose to speak on the power of the word and because society wants us to have an elevator pitch. They want us to be neat and concise. 30 seconds, what do you do? And the reality is, is no one can really fit who they are and really honor all aspects in 30 seconds. And so I said it's time that we use the word and and we add everything that we are to really get a wholeness to it. And I have had people tell me that I'm too complex to actually describe and because of that, you know, it's just too much. And I think fantastic because that means I haven't limited who I am and what I can offer to fit into somebody else's box. And so that's really what it is. It's, it's honoring and it's time management. Um, my kids are older now. Um, lucky for me tonight, my oldest is driving my youngest around to all of his activities. It's, it's a family work, it really is. It's, it's having supportive people and Sometimes it's getting up early. I'm up at 4.15 when I gotta go to school because that's what time I have to get everything done. And it's knowing that um, I get to fulfill my life, so there's no regrets. I, I don't know. I don't think I'm infringing on a personal thing here because you have talked about it elsewhere. But a minute ago, you just jarred my memory when you said it about um, finding quiet time. And uh, this happened, like part of it anyway, happened after your own past. You mentioned and yeah, so my mother passed away very suddenly. We knew she was sick. Um, the doctors, unfortunately, at that time said that they thought she had IBS. Turned out she had late stage liver disease. And so uh, the end came quite quickly. We got the diagnosis on the 1st of June, and she was uh, passed away on the, I think it was the 29th of June. So it happened actually quite, quite quickly. Um, up until then, I was actually a full-time artist. So I had left a little bit the holistics behind. I had left supporting people, and I just painted. <coughs> I wanted to be a full-time mom. I wanted to be there for my kids. I wanted to be cheering them on during their little school productions in the middle of the day. And after my mom passed away, it took me really deep into myself because to overcome or move through grief, you really have to reconnect to who we are. And so I went back really um, quite strong into what brought me meaning. And that's actually what spurred me to get my coaching. And I became a grief recovery method specialist. I ended up actually taking a lot of courses through the shamanic practices because that made sense to me. And it brought me um, just peace. Peace in what I was going through and understanding. Because when someone passes away that's close to us, and up until then I need to explain, I have had over 15 friends pass away, numerous relatives. I have known death on so many different aspects. But when someone really, really dear to us leaves us, and quite suddenly, all of a sudden you realize you lost a cheerleader. And sometimes that's what hits, is the meaning that that person brought to your life. Because it's the story we grieve, it's the connection, it's the relationship. It's not what they were, it's who they were to us. And I found that there wasn't a lot of support. And there wasn't a lot of, it was a lot of intellectual, it was a lot of, this is what you need to do. Um, here I had one session where I created a vase and the therapist told me to put all my emotions inside of it and that's where we left it. And I thought, isn't this the point? We need to take all this stuff out. But to do it fully, I wanted to get trained. Because there's a lot of people out there that aren't trained. So I make sure I have my certificates. I make sure I have my um, my um, de my degrees, my diplomas, so that I can do it fully. 
Um, but that is ultimately what led me on to try and support people because I realized I see the world a little bit differently. And uh, there's a lot of people out there that see it like me too. So. One last thing before we open up to questions because I'm sure there's lots here. Um, I found on your YouTube talk, uh, it was um, titled, Artists Are People Too. So not only for the, only the viewers in the audience, but for the artists in the audience, could you talk a little bit about that? I totally can. I did that YouTube, and I was sharing before, once I say something, it's gone. So, <laughs> I'm gonna pull up with what I said on that talk. It's okay. Um, it's, um, what I find is a lot of people see us more just as beings versus humans. So they forget that we have emotions, we, we um, maybe don't have a great day, but you know what, we're at a show anyways, because this is part of, part of the job. Um, and for instance, this morning I was actually teaching at a school. I taught a kindergarten class artwork, we did sloppy art, so I got to spend it with all these little kids. And I told them, I asked them, I said, what do you think the hardest thing is to be an artist? And they said, painting. And I said, actually, no. I said, that's the part we love the most. I said, the hardest part of being an artist is actually having the courage and having the empowerment within ourselves to do it. I share with um, the talk that I have given to junior high students about art artists is that we have some of the thickest skin that I know in an industry because we do have people come up to us and criticize us. We do have people saying, hey, my child can do better than you. <laughs> That's actually quite common. Um, I've had people with my art saying, you know what, you wasted your time, you should have took a picture. And it's the most amazing thing what people think that they are so freely to tell us. And meanwhile, you're sitting there, you're working. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so, it's just smiling and nodding, and thank you so much for stopping by and sharing your thoughts with me. I really like what you said there because that painting is not about what you see. No, it's not. And it's it's really, when people say comments like that, it says more about them than it does about me. And so that's the reality of learning about human nature, right? But there's all the emotions, all the travels that have gone into that painting, up and down the emotions happy thoughts of your past life, what you're thinking about, that's all that that painting is about, yes. besides the image. It is. There's actually a really great little reel on Instagram and Facebook that I see, and it was about what is what Instagram thinks female artists look like when we paint, and then what really we look like, mm -hmm. right? And it shows, at first, this woman in this beautiful dress, painting, her hair is all done, and then it's what, what do we really look like? And there's the anguish, and there's the sitting back, or what am I supposed to be doing? And that is what art is. The artwork at the end is beautiful, and the journey for an artist to create it can take them anywhere, so. Is there anything else you want to add before we open up the floor of party? That was amazing. I could sit and talk to you all night, and tomorrow too. <laughs> so I'm going to open the floor up to Carlos if you have any questions. Could you I'm an author too, and I would love to hear about well a summary of the book that you've written and um, what its purpose is and its name, please. For sure. So I, I don't know if everyone can hear. She asked if I could just share a summary of my book, um, what was kind of the meaning behind it, and then what was the purpose of writing it, which is a great question. Um, so I'll start with the um, purpose. <coughs> the reason why I wrote this book was when I was in Hawaii in 2017, I saw how people were mistreating the animal. Um, when I was on the beach, and what I came to me when I saw this huge crowd crowding around the sea turtles, people weren't respecting the animals, you know, space. I thought, you know what? I think people might actually pick up an art book, and then I could fool them, and they can learn a little bit about the animal. And this is a way of reaching maybe those people who typically wouldn't pick up a sea turtle scientific book, but it's possible I can reach a few of those people. So it kind of started down a couple different paths. 
Um, at the beginning of my book, I share the scientific facts of the animal. I talk about the different sea turtles that I paint. I talk about their importance um, in the painting process. I share a little bit about what I look for as an artist in the animal. Um, and I share some of the dialogue I've had with the marine biologists that I've talked to. So I have connected with specialists with leatherbacks, loggerheads, and green sea turtles. Um, because of that, what's amazing is they knew my work before we had met because um, they saw what I had done. So my reputation exceeded me, so you never know who's actually paying attention to you, right? The first part of the book shares a little bit about that and the journeys and where I got my images from. So my family generally goes to see turtle locations, whether it is an aquarium, my kids used to think, here we are, mom, we're going to see some animals somewhere again. Um, the most amazing experience I had with the sea, tur sea turtle was we went, um, we were in um, California, we went to Script, Scripps, which is a aquarium down there. And there was a whole bunch of ladies piled around this loggerhead. Um, he had been injured and so they couldn't re-release him. So he's in captivity for the rest of his life. <coughs> And um, they couldn't get him to move. He wouldn't leave the bottom of the water. And they were so upset. I walked up and that turtle chased me wherever I walked. And I started kind of almost doing like running back and forth and he was chasing me with it. And those women were so upset because <laughs> I got that animal to move. So I share stories like that. So my experiences with the animals. The last part of the book is actually about the messages that I share with each of the pieces to increase, uh, increase hope, awareness for oneself and the world. The oceans, Earth. When was it published? It was published actually in 2019. By? Um, I self-published it. Yeah, it's a self-published book. Do you have it in bookstores now? It is in um, a few of the Indigos. Yeah, it was in quite a few of the bookstores. Um, and I ended up just pulling them because I found I sold more than the bookstores did. Yeah, yeah, and the thing is actually, what's interesting is about the bookstores themselves is all the, a lot of the books that are in there are actually owned by the artists. And so when they get lifted, it's actually from me, it's not from the bookstore themselves. So I kind of like taking control of that a little bit. Any more questions? Are you planning another trip? Mm -hmm. Not actually for a while. So we were in Hawaii in uh, November and uh, we had a big year last year because pre-COVID we were supposed to go to uh, actually Ireland and Hawaii, but we had to cancel all our trips like everybody else. So we used up all of our flight credits this past year. And um, this next year, to um, the next couple of years, we're staying low, uh, a little bit close to home. Um, plus, with me taking on extra studies, I don't want to travel as much because i got a lot going. So the next place will probably be England or uh, London so that I can actually go get a hoodie from where I'm going to school. So. Is there no uh, marine wildlife like <coughs> on the coast of Canada that you could get in touch with? Like, can you... Yep, so I work with yeah. Canadian Sea Turtle Network, which is on the east coast of Canada. Um, Canadian Sea Turtles are actually leatherbacks. Mm -hmm. um, and they never come ashore. Oh, okay. So they are only in the water. The only sea turtles that actually come up to shore to sun are the green sea turtles. Uh, they will get sometimes caught in the undercurrents or the warm currents and end up in our waters, but then they end up with um, basically in human language is hypothermia, which is why um, Schoona in the Vancouver Aquarium is there. So that's how she ended up there. So Schoona got caught up and she was found in, I think it was called Schooner's Cove, by some fishermen. Um, the aquarium went in and they kind of nursed her back to health because she was basically hypothermia. They had to feed her her abnormal diet, which is why they can't re-release her, because she found a taste for the food that they fed her to try and get her back. Um, the cool thing about the green sea turtles is midlife, at age 25, they change their diet. They go from omnivores to vegetarians. So they're the only sea turtle that switches their diet and that's at age of reproduction. So until about 
25 to 30, uh, scientists don't know what sex or gender the animal is. And what they find is, in Hawaii, I found out that they actually draw blood from them and they find out through a blood, blood analysis what the gender is because it's the length of the tail that tells you whether or not it's a female or male. That's the only um, identifier. Yeah, so, but with Canadians, so I do try and work as much as I can. We get loggerheads also along our coastlines, but it's all on the east coast, and again, they don't come ashore. They don't come That's ashore. That's another type of turtle? Sorry? That's another type of Yeah, so we have, lo in Canadian waters, we have loggerheads. Um, they eat crustaceans, they're in murky water. Uh, that's um, that's their their diet, um, and actually you can tell which ones feed the most because they actually get suntan, so they go more orangey color the more that they're at the surface of the water. Uh, so the one I have in the show here, he's quite pale because that was the one that was in the aquarium. He's never seen the sun. Um, and then we have leatherbacks. They are in the Pacific Ocean. They're very very rare, almost extinct. So the Pacific. Leatherbacks are um, very rare to see, whereas in the Atlantic, they're quite horrific. Um, and the Canadian Sea Turtle Network is the first one ever to tag a male leatherback. So that's how they could start to track them to find out where their mating grounds were and all of that um, information. So sea turtles are fascinating, but they're all so different. But the only ones we see on land from Mexico um, or Hawaii is the green sea turtle, unless it's the females coming up to nest. But males for the other species never ever ever come to shore except for the green. Huh. Any more questions? I'd just like to ask um, uh, oh. person. Okay. The, this picture that is amazing. I'm just looking at the picture and the clarity and the emotion. How long did it take you to do this picture? and you know really going to the depths of what you put together so that's always a really hard question to answer because i never ever kind of clock it um i started that piece um in december and i finished it this week so mm -hmm. it gives you a bit of time doesn't mean that i painted the entire time um i paint in really thin layers so I've been actually told that I paint like an oilist, but I paint with acrylic. Um, so it's a lot of washes to get my backgrounds in. So they take a long time to dry. Um, it took me a while. It was, I've never painted a painting like that. So that one actually was quite a good challenge um, because I had to allow my brain to accept the blurry one in the background because <laughs> I've never done that before. Um, and when I sit down though, I will paint in one to two hour increments and then I get up and do something else and then I go back to the piece. Because what I found was that break, you almost re-see the painting again. And sometimes where you thought you were failing, you come back and you realize you were succeeding and other times you think you're succeeding, you come back and you have to repaint it off. So it gives you that kind of moment to reassess where you're going. Um, with these, I work from photograph, and then I will pull it up on my computer and zoom in to the animal to get the um, the, the fine stuff. The detail is amazing. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm awfully interested in all the write-ups you have with every painting, and I really connect, as you know, because we're both artists together, and uh, there's so much feeling and spirituality in every single one of your paintings and I can mm -hmm. see where your emotions have come through the connection and it's just amazing to realize and I know myself I didn't realize I was doing that so I really relate to what you're saying because I put a painting on Facebook and a fellow I told Elizabeth wrote me back and he said he saw five faces mm -hmm. in my waterfall. And I said, really? So I went back and he said, it tells me you're a very spiritual person, which I am. But I was blown away and never noticed that. Mm -hmm. And now, <laughs> like Elizabeth said, even find animals that I saw oh, painted within something. 
But it, I was going around reading all um, the write-up about each painting, and there was so, and the title. There's so much uh, spirituality in that, and I'm sure you benefited from every brush stroke. Definitely. Um, so with each of the pieces, the, the title and the message is almost what I'm processing while I'm, while I'm going through that. The title for the piece comes through the painting. Yes. So it's not designed to not the time. Um, it is a flow process. It's a creative process. Mm -hmm. um, the funny thing is, is for my schooling, I had to do a strengths test. Um, so I end up with this program, the masters I'm taking is I will use a lot of testing to identify people's strengths and we help build people up because uh, it's positive psychology. It's about the study of well-being and happiness, actually, is what I get to study, which is beautiful because it's the higher side of life. Um, I had to do a strength test. So I did it one, and it was pretty accurate. And I thought, you know what, though? I did a lot of like neutral responses. I should go back and redo the test, but force myself not to be neutral on everything so that I could get a more accurate read. On um, both of them, number one was spirituality. So that is ultimately my first filter in everything that I experience. And um, what was interesting was doing that test twice um, was that my top six strengths were the exact same. They were just slightly altered. What changed was my lower strengths actually shifted quite a bit. So by being more true to my answers itself. Uh, I used to hide my spirituality actually quite a bit because uh, society yeah. is really questionable. In the art industry, I'm like, all of us are spiritual, it's great. <laughs> we all see into stuff, we all really work into it. Uh, but it took a lot of courage to start to share what, mm -hmm. how I saw the world, right? So I, um, and actually it was after my mom, I, I got a specialization in supporting highly sensitive people, which is coming up in psychology quite a bit, because they make up 15% of the population. That's how your brain is actually wired and it's how your brain is formed, and I am one as well, so who better to support yeah. people well, with so that? Well, it shows your paintings. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hi, um, yeah, I was just wondering, so with like the spirituality stuff, and um, I'm just wondering, like, when you're doing more of like the scientific kind of stuff you're doing, um, how do you go about working with things that are a little more technical? Well, and they're like science-based, and I don't know, is it Akashic Records that you do, or? Yeah, so I, I've been trained in the Akashic Records, and what I love doing is finding the science behind the spirituality. So a lot of the stuff, what I do is I try and bring the science in. So if you actually really look at a lot of what psychology does, it's almost very, very similar to what's done in the holistics. It's just called something else. It's not a culture. That's all it is. Um, and so... Akashic Records is interesting. I actually took that course more for myself. Um, my mom had only been passed for six months, and I found that it was almost like that connection with the, the realm you can't see, right? So it's like you just lost someone, and that's a really good way to feel you're still connected to someone who's no, who's no longer physically here. Um, I was blessed because my girlfriend is a teacher and highly trained. So the Akashic Records itself, for those who don't know what that is, um, each one of us, they say, has a records of our entire life and that you can access them anytime. A lot of times with the Akashic Records, what's interesting is um, they are accessed through multiple different modalities. So journey is a way of um, almost accessing the same um, um, information through shamanic type studies. Uh, meditation, um, you can do the same. And um, the Akashic Records itself, um, I guess in some ways, so my girlfriend, who, who I trained under, she would say that I paint in the Akashic Records all the time. Um, so for me, it's not a conscious working with the records, but I do know people who do that, for sure. Um, but I do, I love finding science to prove the stuff a lot of people say. Yeah, I didn't know there was if you 
start looking actually, so I just finished a program where I audited um, through a university down in the U.S. and it was a, a anthropological look at shamanism, spirituality, and it's actually referenced quite a bit. So it depends on what science side you look at. Great, so. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Great. Thank you so much. Let's hear